welcome back. And as you watch this, I am currently gallivanting around the northeast on a pretty epic road trip to some pretty special places. So hopefully a lot more to come on that uh, soon. But leading up to that trip, now when I'm filming this, I'm in the middle of preparing for that. I needed to maybe take a break from some of the uh, projects that we've been doing that have just been really doing my head in and uh, do something that was maybe a little more therapeutic and relaxing. And that is where this beautiful machine to my right here comes into play. This is a Magnavox Concert Grand, and this one is particularly special because my grandfather bought it new in 1962. Or at least we think 1962, the uh, manuals and schematics all have a date of 1962 on it, but he very well could have bought it in 1963 as well. I don't really think it would have been any later than 63 though, because the models were changing by that point. But uh, this was <laughs> an absolutely mega purchase and my grandfather didn't do any half measures. When he bought something, he bought the very best. And the Magnavox Concert Grand was the very best console stereo you could buy. Does AM, does FM, does FM MPX, I'm not really sure what that means, has a built-in record player and has jacks for an external input. And after he passed, I inherited it and it is still up and running wonderfully. Uh, although I am using it in a slightly different configuration than he probably intended. Instead of listening to records on it or listening to AM or FM, we live so far out in the country that I actually don't pick up any radio stations on it anyways. I've got it plugged into our uh, smart TV up here as an external speaker. So I can uh, hop over to YouTube and put on an album and listen to it through the glorious sound of the Magnavox. Now, I am deaf in one ear. I don't hear hardly anything out of this. And what I do hear is blown out by the massive amount of white noise that that ear generates. Uh, so audio projects are usually lost on me, but even I with my deaf ear can hear the difference in audio quality that this thing puts out compared to every other stereo amplifier I have ever heard. This is far and away the best sounding stereo on the planet, in my opinion at least. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really demonstrate audio to you guys over YouTube because uh, whatever my mic picks up is going to be compressed and digitized and then that's going into YouTube's compression algorithm which is going to make an absolute wreck of it and then it's going to be played out through whatever speakers that you have. So the actual audio quality and clarity of this won't be able to be conveyed via YouTube very well but what we can do, and this is something that I've been wanting to do for a little while, is pull it out and take a look at the inside. Now, when I got this going a couple years back, uh, I didn't do the best job ever tidying up the wires and it's been slowly nagging at me. So I wanna pull it out, clean up and tidy up the wires as best as I can. And then I wanna pull one of the amplifiers out, set it up on the bench and walk you guys through why this stereo sounds so good. Because once you see the amplifier, you get it. So let's slide this thing forward and uh, take a look at the insides. First things first, we got to slide this beast out and that's no easy task. Like any quality piece of furniture, it weighs a ton. Uh, but once out and uh, we have access to the back panel, let's go ahead and get that back panel off. It's held on with 16 screws around the periphery that screw straight into the wood paneling. I saved the top center screw for last to make it easier to remove. And with the back panel out of the way, gives amazing access to the entire stereo. And you can see that there was an attempt at wire management. In my defense, Magnavox didn't arrange it in such a way that makes it easy to manage, but I still think we can do better. Uh, we'll start with removing the amplifiers by disconnecting the audio input. Then we'll remove this massive connector that goes to the speakers followed by the power cables that are just regular 120 volt plugs into distribution sockets in the center. There are four bolts that hold the amplifier in place and despite how tight it is in there, they were relatively easy to access. With those removed, the amplifier just pulls right out and it alone has quite a bit of heft to it. 
Uh, next up, let's remove the receiver module on the bottom in the center. It has two plugs going into it, uh, one a multi-pin plug into a socket, and the other an RCA style plug. Uh, the unit is held in place with four screws on little rubber isolators, and access is much tighter than the amplifier. But with those four screws removed, the unit comes right out, and it is much lighter than the amplifier, so it makes trying to get it out of this tight space a little easier. Finally, let's get the main stereo unit out starting with unplugging it from the power supply. Then there are four wood screws that go straight into the wood holding it in place. These longer ones in the back actually hold little jam posts that keep it located nice and up front. With all of that removed though, the whole unit slides out the back on a large sled. Now I want to get a look at the speakers just to see how big they are. Uh, there are 12 screws holding this back cover in place, and with all 12 removed, it pops right off. And just look at the size of that woofer. I believe that is a 15-inch beast hiding out in there. And right above the woofer is the treble horn, which is no slouch either. Alright, enough gawking, let's get to cleaning. And first I'll start by vacuuming up a bunch of the dust bunnies, and then I'll dive in deep with chemicals. The wires were all gooey and gross and covered in 60 years of baked on grime. So I pulled out the Simple Green and Goo Gone and just scrubbed until they started to clean up and be a little less nasty. Uh, and then back in my office, I decided to give all the tubes a good wipe down, popping each tube out, cleaning it up, and then cleaning all the excess dust and dirt and grime off of the chassis itself. Uh, the receiver unit has a pretty hefty harness coming out of it as well, so that also had the same gooey problem. I spent quite a bit of time scrubbing those wires clean, and they seemed to come up pretty decently as well. Now that we got everything out and cleaned, let's take a look at each individual component. And this is the main stereo component. It looks absolutely gorgeous on the front here. Uh, unfortunately, while I was out handling it, the uh, string for the dial on the front here broke. Um, I didn't hear it break. I don't remember it breaking. Uh, I just looked over and it was already broken. Looks like it broke right here. Uh, that is unfortunate. I'll have to fix that in the future. I don't have any spare string that I think will work and it's going to take a bit of effort to try and get everything realigned so that way the indicated number matches the actual station that you're on. And uh, that actually makes it even more difficult because I don't get any radio stations out here. There is one AM radio station that we can pick up, but I can't pick it up inside the house. We're far enough away from it that it's not strong enough to penetrate into the house for this radio to pick it up. So we'll have to come up with some way to generate an AM radio station that this thing can read, and then we can go from there. But that's all fairly low priority since we don't listen to the radio on this thing anyways. And uh, if we flip it around here, we can see the back here. This radio has its own power supply. That's this little block right here. The amplifiers have their own power supply built in and uh, this other unit down here that we're going to take a look at in a second looks like it has its own power supply built in. So this power supply is just for this radio. And we can see right up here we've got a nice little Magic Eye tube. Uh, unfortunately, I think the Magic Eye tube uh, changes depending on how well tuned into a radio station you are. And if you can't tune into any radio stations, it never changes. So <laughs> it, it glows a nice green, but it never actually changes around. Uh, the rest of the radio is, well, here's the schematic for it. It's pure magic. I don't understand RF radio stuff. There's all sorts of crazy things going on in here. Uh, I do understand the amplification stages and that's about it. The rest of it is completely lost on me. The power supply though, I do understand. It's really simple. There's just a um, nice big power transformer, a uh, 5Y3. This is a dual diode. Uh, and then this is our rectifier. And then we have a choke and two capacitors in this single can over here. Easy peasy, generates uh, the high voltage, I'm guessing around 300 volts. Uh, I'm guessing that because the capacitor is rated for 450 volts, so they wouldn't have been pushing it too hard. Uh, it also generates five volts for the 5Y3 here, uh, generates 5.8 volts and 6.3 volts. No clue what that 5.8 volts is for, but the 6.3 volts is gonna be the filaments of all the tubes over here. Uh, other than that, 
Well, most of it is beyond me. I do know that it works though, or at least it works in the settings that we want to put it in, which is uh, the tape setting here, which is where our external input is coming in, and that'll send it over to the amplifiers. Now, before we take a look at the amplifiers, I want to look at one more kind of mystery piece that I think I'm starting to figure out, and that is this little guy right here. This is a very curious looking unit because it is completely sealed. Uh, the bottom of it has a complete cover over it that we can't actually access without having to take a bunch of stuff apart. But I believe that this is the receiver unit for a remote control. That's right, the Magnavox Concert Grand had the option to use a remote control in 1962. That is insane. Uh, I actually have a picture of the remote control right here. I unfortunately don't have the remote itself. So if anybody ever comes across one of these, let me know. I would be ecstatic to marry it back to this system. Uh, but uh, the remote control manual that I have here is a little confusing because it's talking about brightness increase, channel select. Uh, so it turns out that Magnavox was also selling the remote control for their television units, where their high-end television units. And uh, when they bought the, when somebody bought the remote control for their console stereo, they just gave them the manual for the TV unit remote control. So not everything lines up as well as it should, but I'm pretty sure that this is the schematic for this receiver unit and the remote control itself. And the rem remote control is fascinating because it uses uh, transistors, <laughs> this weird, strange technology made out of silicon, or ger probably germanium at the time, but <laughs> it's completely bonkers to see transistors being used in the remote for this machine. Everything else is pure vacuum tube because it's plugged into the wall, but the remote control had to be battery powered. So they uh, went above and beyond and got three transistors in there. What's really fascinating about this is that it doesn't do it with tones, it generates a frequency. So we're seeing like 95 cycles per second, 85 cycles per second, 76, 67, 53 cycles per second. So depending on what button you push, it generates a different uh, frequency that this big canned box here picks up and translates into some kind of command for the uh, stereo itself. I'm not entirely sure because like I said, the manual is for the TV version, not the radio version, but I believe that they're largely constructed the same. So it's really awesome that we have that receiver unit in our radio. We just don't have the remote itself. So we've got a lot of hunting and shopping to do. I've been shopping one for one for years. So if anybody knows of one, let me know. I would love to get my hands on one. Uh, but well, this is largely a useless piece because we don't have the remote to go with it. So let's take a look at the real party piece. I'll set this guy down here and this beast is what we're really interested in. And there's two of them. Oh. <laughs> These are the power amplifiers for those massive speakers that we saw earlier. That behemoth of a subwoofer and the massive horn are powered by these guys and they are not pulling any punches at all. You can see that there is a lot of vacuum tubes on display and we have two amplifiers. So each amplifier has a bass channel and a treble channel, and uh, the bass channel is going to be driving that woofer, the treble channel is going to be driving the horn. Uh, so here's the schematic for it. Thankfully we have the schematic, and I think it's relatively simple. Um, if it wasn't painfully obvious, being deaf in one ear and not generally paying much attention to audio stuff, I'm not an audio guy. So I don't know the right terminology for a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing here, but uh, just looking at it and understanding vacuum tubes, I can kind of get a grasp of what's going on. So we have our audio input signal coming in, uh, goes through some filtering, and then it hits the 12 AX7, which is our first amplifier. Uh, and then out of that 12 AX7, for the bass channel, it goes into six 6V6 GT pentodes. Uh, that's these guys right here. Uh, 
Um, now these are set up, I believe, in what's called a push-pull uh, setup. All I know is that with six of them in parallel, it's going to be able to push a lot of power out of it. Uh, the other two 6V6 GTs here on the end are for the treble channel. So the treble channel is not pushing nearly as much juice as the base channel, but the uh, arrangement of it is pretty much identical. You've got a 12AX7, and then you've got two 6V6 GTs set up in, I believe, again, the push-pull setup, uh, and then you have uh, an output transformer for each one, and they ultimately go over to this little plug back here that is the plug that goes to the speakers. These two big behemoths here are 5U4 uh, dual diodes. They set up to make a full bridge rectifier to give very, very clean DC over to the 6V6 GTs that are pumping out the power. And they're so massive because they have to move a lot of power. They have to supply a lot of juice to those 6V6 GTs. Uh, then there's a, we've got our big power transformer and our, and our output transformer. I'm not entirely sure which one is which. Uh, I believe this little guy right here is a choke. I have no clue what's hiding out underneath this box here. Um, and then we have a little smoothing capacitor, I believe, for the 5U4s over here. Um, so relatively simple setup and design, but it's just, I love it because it's just a brute force method of getting the sound out of there. They found an amplifier design that worked well, and then they just paralleled it up to the to oblivion to push as much power through those speakers as possible. And I can attest to the fact that having two of these in that system will rattle the windows at half volume. That thing will blow your eardrums out at full volume. It is amazing. And they sound absolutely glorious. Uh, but well, we can't hear them because right now they're sitting on the table. So I'm going to carry all of this junk back inside, bolt it back into the cleaned up uh, cabinet and do a lot better wire routing this time. I'm going to zip tie them into the correct shapes and uh, let's get some power back into this thing and hopefully she still sounds great. All right, I've got it moderately well organized and I think I've got everything plugged back into the correct spots. I've got the main power switch on, but it's plugged into a little power strip here so I can actually flip the power on separately. Uh, so let's flip it on and make sure that all the filaments are coming up, at least on the amplifiers because they're the easiest to see. Uh, hopefully no smoke comes out of it. So here goes nothing. Power switch is on. Yeah, I can see these 6v6s are coming up. Those 5y3s came up over here. All those 6v6s are up. Uh, that 6v6 does look not look like it came up. Oh, there it goes. Maybe it just had a, a sketchy connection on it. Um, that one has come up. Uh, I can't tell if this one's coming up or not, but it doesn't matter. I can see that the, all the tubes on the radio have come up. So let's see if it makes sound. I've got it plugged into my cell phone here. I'll go ahead and hit play. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can hear sound coming out of it. That's awesome. Uh, I'll pause this because I probably will get copyright struck on that one. Uh, and then I'll hunt down some copyright free music that I can play. But I think this is working. That's awesome. There we have it all back together, all cleaned up, looking absolutely beautiful and sounding amazing. Now I can't play any serious music on this because I'll just get copyright struck immediately, but I can say without a shadow of a doubt, Adam Jones's The Witness is amazing through this. Just absolutely stunning to listen to that song on this stereo. Uh, so grandpa, if you're watching from the great beyond, uh, I may not listen to the same music that you do, but I'm listening to it through the same machine and it is glorious. You bought the best out there and I'm going to say that it's still the best today. <laughs> Magnavox killed it and grandpa, you knew what you were doing. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching today while I did a little bit of tidying up on this beautiful Magnavox concert grand and I'm going to kick the TV off here with a little bit of Ben Prunty because that is royalty free and I'm going to sit back and enjoy the excellent sounds of this Magnavox concert grand. So I want to thank you guys so much and I hope to see you in the next episode.